friends, and welcome back to ASMR Leadership, where I read to you from books with a personal development or leadership focus, because spoken word ASMR, gentle page turning, and mouth sounds help me to relax, and I trust the same is true for you as well. Also, my feeling is that if you're going to invest the time into a long ASMR video, that you might as well come away having learned something. And tonight, I am starting a brand new series. Um, actually, before I get to that, I am drinking some whiskey tonight. New series, new bottle. I cracked this just about an hour ago, and you can see how far into it I am already. So I got a wild air, and we're going to do a new book. Uh, I am going to finish out the other book, but I'm starting a new series in the middle because that's what I felt like doing. Uh, this is a 14-year Oban Highland single malt scotch. It's a very, very fine bottle that I am enjoying very much. Here's to you for joining me. It's Friday night, week four of coronavirus quarantine, and I'm very thirsty. Alright, so here's the book I'm going to start tonight. <clears throat> the title is, It's Called Work for a Reason, Your Success is Your Own Damn Fault, by Larry Wingett. Now, Larry Wingett is a guy who calls himself the pit bull of personal development, and I love him. I've been reading and paying attention to uh, Larry Wingett since about 2007, which is when this book was published. This is the first book of his that I ever picked up. <clears throat> I do have other titles from him. Um, as you can tell, this book, uh, the title is uh, meant to evoke a sense of plain-spoken motivation that I think everybody needs to hear from time to time. Um, this is not like the Dale Carnegie book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which was published in 1936 for the first time. Um, that book has some outdated references, some kind of old-timey language, even though the lessons are timeless. Um, it's a little more of a difficult read than something like this Larry Winkett book. The, the language used in How to Win Friends is just of a different era. So here we are in 2020, and I'm going to dive into a book f that was published in 2007 by a guy who has written books of, uh, with other titles such as Shut Up, Stop Whining, and Get a Life. I like that one as well. I may read it on the channel. Uh, I also have his parenting book called Your Kids Are Your Own Fault. Um, as well as a financial invest, uh, investing book, or a money management book, really, entitled You're Broke Because You Want to Be. Maybe I'll read that one later as well. Um, Larry Wingett uh, also has a podcast called The Real Man Podcast. He's been an in-demand public speaker for 15 years or more, um, and just a very plain-spoken kick your ass, get off the couch and do something with your life kind of guy. And uh, for that reason, I really respect him. He kind of cuts against the grain of other motivational speaker, personal development type people. Um, so for that reason, I love him. And I'm excited to dive into It's Called Work for a Reason That Your Success is Your Own Damn Fault. So with that... Thank you for joining me. I'm going to read the preface of this book first, and then probably dive into chapter one as well, and we'll see how long the video ends up being. We'll do the preface and chapter one. I'm in that kind of mood. All right. The preface. Before you start this book, 
you need a word of warning. There will be parts of this book you won't like. Why would I say that? Why would any author begin his book by telling his readers they won't like it? Because you will find out soon enough anyway, and I think that you should be forewarned. I would rather just tell you up front that my book is going to contain lots of stuff that will make you mad. Stuff that will bother you. Stuff that will be contrary to what you have become comfortable with. Contrary to what you believe. Stuff that will piss you off and insult you. Telling you all of this up front just seems more honest to me. Now that we have all of that out of the way, can you tell already that this book is not going to be your typical business book? I hope so. I have read thousands of books. Thousands of business books. That is no exaggeration. I really have read thousands. All except a handful have been a total waste of time. That's a pretty strong statement right there. As a reader, I would have appreciated being warned that the business book I was about to read was nothing but worthless drivel. But they didn't warn me. The author let me read the entire book and find out, page by page, that it was full of meaningless information. And then I was finished. Sorry, and when I was finished, I put the book down and was pissed off that I had just wasted my time reading a book that basically said very little and had no practical application. <clears throat> Do you see why I like this guy? Most of the authors of business books on the market today like to stroke people's egos by reinforcing information that they already know. They tend to say, you are really doing a good job and you just need to do it a little bit better or think slightly differently. Others give you a detailed statistical analysis of the economy or buying trends or other analytical detail that encourages you to get lost in the pages of boredom until you have no idea what the book is even about. Some authors exploit the hottest new buzzwords of the day. Think branding and beat it to death without giving you any real idea what to do, uh, how to do, what they suggest must be done. Some say that all you have to do is love your job in order to be successful at it. The worst of the lot tell cute little parables through inane dialogues with messages so simple and trite that we should all be insulted. Business books contain too much jargon, too much cute, too much pie in the sky, too much BS, too much of everything except the key ingredient to success in business. Work. All of those books are selling a load of crap, and people are lapping it up like ice cream. The bottom line answer to every problem in business is this. Most employees are simply not, not doing a good job. In fact, they barely do their jobs at all. Workers are poorly trained, if trained at all. Customer service isn't just bad, it's atrocious. And companies tolerate it, holding no one responsible, while blaming the stupidity of the customer, or a bad economy, or instead of their, uh, instead of their employees, and ultimately, themselves. Sales results are down in most companies because the salespeople don't pick up the phone and actually talk to customers. Customer service is horrible because employees aren't working at serving their customers, and their managers don't care enough to do anything about it. Employees don't do their jobs because no one expects them to, and there are no real penalties, penalties for not doing their jobs. In this book, I will make the case that poor results are the result of poor performance. I will take on the issues of sales, customer service, leadership, and management, team building, change, and working with others, and will point the finger of blame exactly where it needs to be pointed, in your face. This book is going to be different.
different from any you have read before. I'm going to give it to you straight, with no sugar coating and no cute little parables. I'm going, I'm going to use words that you are familiar with, because I talk like you do. This is a very opinionated book. That's really all I have to offer. Opinions. Opinions I have developed after years of real living, real working, real managing, real experience, and being real stupid. These opinions have worked for me in every area of my work experience. I believe they will work for you, too. Why should you listen to me? I know what I'm talking about. I grew up working at anything that paid a buck. I shoveled manure, trimmed trees, was one of the first male telephone operators in the Bell system. I worked retail, sold, managed, and was the company president. I've been on the payroll, and I've been responsible for making payroll. I've worked at just about every level of management and non-management in both little bitty companies and in some of the largest companies on earth. I was an award-winning salesperson and a top-ranked sales manager for AT&T. I started three companies from nothing and built them to be successful, thriving businesses. I've worked with and spoken to nearly 400 of the Fortune 500 companies. I've traveled the world, speaking to every kind of business organization and association imaginable. I am a member of the International Speaker Hall of Fame. I am the host of a television show, helping people who made financial disasters of their lives. Impressed yet? It doesn't matter. Just know this. I've worked for big companies, and I've managed and owned small companies. I did a lot of things right along the way. I have also made every stupid mistake anyone can make in business. I have lost sales, delivered bad customer experience, treated employees poorly, been lazy, the works. I've even gone bankrupt and lost it all. If it can be done wrong, I have done it. I could be the poster child for stupidity in business. I am not a professor of economics, and I don't have a PhD in business. I am a regular guy who came up the hard way with lots of hard work. I learned some stuff along the way. I talked to people smarter than I was to learn from their experiences. I read more than 3,000 books, some horrible and some priceless so I could figure out what works and what doesn't work. I listened to more than 5,000 hours of audio from the best business minds around and got every morsel of good information I could from them. I studied, listened, and experimented until I found out what it took to be successful. I went from bankrupt to millionaire. Sorry, I went from bankrupt to multi-millionaire. As a result, I now travel the world speaking to business people about how to be more successful. I talk to people in the trench trenches, the people who really do the work. I work with managers, franchise owners, and frontline supervisors who are desperate for some straight talk on how to do a little better. I talk to white collar, blue collar, and no-collar employees who aren't getting what they need from anyone else. They pay me to tell them what to do. That's what you are doing when you buy this book, paying me to give you some usable advice on how to be more successful. I want you to get your money's worth. How do I know this book is for me, Larry? If you get a paycheck, this book is for you. It's for you if you work for a living, have ever worked for a living, or ever plan on working for a living. It is for the kid straight out of college about to start his first real job, to the CEO who has been around for 50 years. It is for the 
secretary, the salesperson, the stock clerk, and the janitor. I have written this book for anyone who has a job, whether you manage others or others manage you. This book contains some answers, not all the answers for sure. I would never pretend to have all the answers. These are just the answers to problems I have faced in business. These ideas are the things that have personally worked for me. I won't ask you to do anything that I haven't done myself. If my ideas make sense to you, then try them to see if they work. If they work for you, then celebrate, because it's all been worth it. If my ideas don't make sense to you, I suggest you try them anyway. After all, what you are currently doing probably isn't working so well, and you are, and you are probably ready for something new. If you try my ideas, and they don't work, what have you really lost? A little time, a little effort, and a little money. But you will still, still be one step closer to knowing what is right for you. As you read this book, you may be prone to say, I know this stuff. I hope you do. I can't imagine where you have been hiding if you haven't become familiar with the concepts of taking personal responsibility, doing what you are paid to do, having personal integrity, using common sense, doing the right thing, and making tough decisions. That's the crux of my book. No brain surgery involved. Just a handful of simple ideas we should all be reminded of and shown how to use in every situation. These ideas are perfect for anyone in any business, and they are more than just business ideas. They are ideas for life. So let's get started. Let me beat you up, tick you off, and possibly teach you something along the way. Be open to finding one good idea. Yes, just one. There is no shortage of good ideas here, but my goal is that you find a good idea and you will put it to use immediately. One good idea can change your life, change your business, and make you rich. If you only got one good idea from this book, wouldn't it be worth the price you paid for it? Of course it would. So start reading. Get a highlighter and a pen and start marking up the book as you go. Find your one good idea and get started on it today. And then there's a quote before, before chapter one. The, the quote is from Bill Maher. People would rather be nice than right, rather be sensitive than be true. Well, being nice and sensitive are important, but they're not more important than being right. They're not more important than the truth. That is a great quote. All right. Can you see already why I like this guy? I've been following his work for a number of years now. Let's jump into chapter one, entitled, Hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work I go. Bye, honey, I'm going to work. Oh, bull, you aren't going to work at all. You are going to that place that isn't home, where you have to dress a little better than you do around the house. You aren't going to the place that is full of other people who just lied. Sorry. It's a good scotch. You are going to the place that is full of other people who just lied to their significant others when they said they were going to work, quote unquote. You are all liars. You and those people you say you work with. You say you are co-workers when the truth is you are only co-goers. Most studies say that people actually work only about half of the time they are on the job. And, and don't 
ask me to cite to those to cite those studies. I didn't actually have the time to do the work to find the studies. I was too busy goofing off. You know about goofing off, don't you? You do it about half the time you are at work. Quote unquote. But I have heard about those studies. And they almost all say that people only work about half the time. They rest. The rest of the time is spent socializing, eating, griping, writing emails, surfing the web, drinking coffee, daydreaming, going to the bathroom more than you need to, and stretching every break from 15, 15 minutes to 25 minutes, and lunch hour to 75 minutes. This translates to a 50% effort from 100% of the employees. And the reason it goes by unchecked is because every single person in the company is doing it, from the janitor to the CEO. When everyone works half the time, it takes twice as many people to do the work. That translates to higher payroll expenses, higher insurance costs, higher taxes, and higher prices. The high cost of doing business is the result of lazy people not working. Reality check, it's called work for a reason. It's not called playtime. It's not called socializing time. It's called work. Sadly, most employees don't seem to understand this concept. Schools don't teach it. Kids aren't taught it at home. It isn't made clear to new employees. It isn't enforced. It isn't really expected. It isn't managed. The example isn't there. It is only griped about when it doesn't get done. You were hired to work. What is work? Being productive, getting results. That's why they hired you. You are there to generate more revenue for the company than you cost the company. Your contribution must outweigh your expense. You do that you do that not by dilly-dallying around, but by doing the assigned tasks in a fast, efficient, cost-effective way. You do that by being proficient at doing the right things. You will know you are doing a good job when you are tired from doing it. You will know that you are working when you break a sweat, either physically or mentally. Got it? You aren't working as hard as you think you are. Like most people, you work just hard enough so they won't fire you. And you and they pay you just enough so you won't quit. That's an amazing line. Like most people, you work just hard enough so they won't fire you. And they pay you just enough so you won't quit. Your company isn't working as hard as its annual report says. It gives lip service to customer service, but doesn't really deliver it. It says, we are making every effort to, when what it really means is, we're having meetings about it and sending out memorandums regarding it. Face it, productivity sucks. Want me to prove it? What have you accomplished today? Seriously. What have you done that actually contributes to the bottom line of the organization that writes you a check? Don't lie. Don't lie. Don't fool yourself. Just tell yourself the truth. You are, you are the only one who knows. Sorry. You are the only one who will know right now. So go ahead and ask. What have I done today? Go ahead and do it. I've got time. What have you done? Now, cut it by 75% and you will be closer to the real truth about what you have actually done. How does this happen? We focus on process instead of accomplishment. We have become spectators instead of doers. We reward the wrong thing. We tolerate poor performance. We don't teach people how to be good workers. We don't create an environment that promotes work. Expectations are low. Enough reasons. Not really, but it's a good start.
It will force you to constantly evaluate your tasks and separate them into what would be nice to do and what absolutely has to get done. This is really what the whole concept of time management is about. Doing what has to get done. But time management became something else over the years. You don't have the time to manage your time. It's time consuming. Time spent managing time is time that could be spent doing other things, like getting the things done that have to get done. Everyone should forget about managing time and should instead focus on managing priorities. When the right things get done, time takes care of itself. The problem is that priorities are not clearly defined. Face it, if the most important things get done, what else really matters? The key is to know what the most important thing is. There's a quote from Roy Disney. When priorities are clear, decision making is easy. So what is the most important thing that has to get done in your business? Do you even know? If you don't, then you are wasting time, energy, and money. Every individual in the business has to know the important. Every individual in the business has to know the most important thing that must be done every day. But Larry, those things and others must all be done. That's the problem. Lots of things should get done, and yet little of what absolutely has to get done actually gets done. What has to get done really has to get done. I didn't say should get done or would be nice if it got done. I said absolutely has to get done. And as soon as you know what has to get done, do it. It's as simple as that. Just do what absolutely has to get done. I didn't say that you should do only that, but I did say do that. Do it first. Don't do anything else until it is done. Even if you have an overwhelming amount you would like to get done, and it should be done, do what absolutely has to get done first. If that is the only thing you get done all day, you will be better off for having done it. It is really that simple. Know your priorities. Each job has priorities. A salesperson priority. A salesperson's priority is to make sales. What goes into making sales? Talking to customers. You normally can't sell something until you ask someone to buy. That means the most important thing for any salesperson to do is to talk to customers and ask them to buy. Do salespeople have other things to do? Of course they do. They have to fill out their paperwork turn in their orders, do follow-up within the company about their sales, and on and on and on. Those things all should be done, and they will get done right after the thing that absolutely must get done is done. Every person's job has lots of things that must be done every day. I understand that. The problem is that we end up doing what we would like to get done, and the one thing that, that absolutely must get done just doesn't seem to get done. Why? There was no time to do it. Well, bull. There is always enough time to do the one thing that must be done. That's why the, quote, things that have to get done list is so important. It will help you set your priorities and accomplish exactly what is crucial to success. We have become spectators instead of doers. People are no longer conditioned to work. They are conditioned to watch other people work. We have all become masters of observation. It is easier to watch friends on TV than it is to have a friend or be a friend. It is easier to watch other people get a job on The Apprentice than it 
find a job yourself. It's easier to be a big loser by sitting on your butt watching the big loser than it is to get off your butt and lose weight yourself. It's much more fun to watch someone on television painting our living room than it is to do it yourself. It is even easier to watch people on television use a TV nanny to discipline their kids than it is to discipline your own kids. So is it any wonder that when we come to work, we find it easier to watch others work than to do it ourselves? While this is a societal problem that, is, that has huge implications, in business it kills productivity and costs us all. We reward the wrong things. We have a tendency to reward busy people for looking busy instead of getting things done. The guy who puts out every little effort, yet accomplishes things, rarely gets much recognition. People will label him as lucky, or say that good things just fall on his lap. So, what if he really is lucky? What if good things really do just fall on his lap? What difference would that make? If he gets things done, he deserves the credit. We reward people who come in early, stay late, and skip their lunch hours, all in the name of accomplishment. I wouldn't do this. If an employee can't figure out how to get her job done in the number of hours she is paid to work, it probably means she is goofing off when she is supposed to be working. Remember, it's not how many hours you put into the work, but how much work you put into the hours. Am I saying that you should never come in early, stay late, skip a lunch hour? Not at all. Sometimes you do what it takes to get the job done. But routinely, a job can be done in the number of hours for which you are paid. You don't reward someone for being a workaholic. It isn't healthy, and it sends the wrong signals to both the workaholic and to the other employees.
expectations are low, standards are lower. I have a friend who manages the shoe department at a, at a major high-end department store. She told me not long ago that her big, biggest challenge was to get people to actually come to work. And when they do, she is so happy to have warm bodies working the floor that she doesn't say that much about performance. She even related a story about an employee who on his second day of work went to lunch and didn't come back. He then showed up three days later for his shift and was amazed that he had been fired. Employees don't perform well because they aren't expected to perform well. Their manager, their management is just happy they came to work. So how they deal with customers, make sales, work well with others, and learn the company's product line hardly enters into the picture. Standards are lower than expectations. When you don't expect much, you don't get much. When you don't get much over a long period of time, performance standards drop. Did you ever go to a great restaurant that in time became your favorite? You went there fairly often. The word got out, and soon you couldn't even get a reservation there. Then one day, it just wasn't as good as it once was. The service was a little slow, the water glass was a little dirty, and the food wasn't quite as good. You were unhappy, but realized that everyone can have a bad day, so you returned a few weeks later. But again, it wasn't like it used to be. You tried it one more time. A month later, you drive by, and there are four cars in the parking lot. Two months later, a for lease sign is in the front of the building. How did that happen? One day, a manager let a mistake slide. He didn't correct it because he was too busy or didn't feel good or just wasn't or it just wasn't worth the argument. So the employee got by with less than excellent performance. A couple of other employees noticed that the first guy didn't get in trouble for sloppy performance. So they decided, they deduced, it was okay to do the same. The manager wasn't complaining, and the customers weren't saying anything. At that point, poor performance became standard performance. The manager might have mentioned it to the employees, and perhaps their, res perhaps their response was that the first guy got by with it, so what was the problem? Regardless, it didn't get fixed and excellence slipped into mediocrity. Before you know it, everyone is out of a job. One little slip and the whole place goes under. Extreme, maybe, but maybe not. It takes time, that's for sure. But the organizations that refuse to accept poor performance at any level and that make the time to deal with every slip in service do well regardless of economic conditions. They thrive in spite of it all just because they expect, demand, and deliver excellence at every level. Is it tough to pull off? Of course it is. That's why so few do it. But it's what you were hired to do and what you are paid to do every day. Not doing it means you are stealing money from your employer by not giving them what they paid you to do. In other words, you are a thief. What? How dare you call me a thief? You don't even know me. Sure I do. I know you well enough, without ever having met you, to tell you that every day you steal. While you are probably not stealing money from the cash register, or embezzling funds from the big account, or even swiping paper clips and post-it notes, I can still guarantee you are a low-down, dirty thief. Anytime you don't give your best effort, you are stealing. You steal from your company because they paid you for your best effort. You steal from your co-workers because they have to pick up your slack. 
you steal from your customers because they pay retail for your best effort. Most of all, you steal from yourself. Answer these questions honestly. Do you knowingly stretch your coffee break and your lunch hour for longer than the allotted time? Do you ever give a project less than your best effort? Do you ever tell a little fib about how busy you were when in truth you were slacking off? Are you ever guilty of giving your customers less than great service? Do you ever take the easy road instead of the right road? Do you ever call in sick when really you just wanted a day off? If you answer yes to even one of these questions, you are a thief. And while all of us are guilty of some of these types of offenses from time to time, letting any of these slide will lead to a habit of mediocrity instead of excellence. Think no one notices. It doesn't matter, because even if they don't, you will know. You will know that you didn't do your best. You will know that you got paid for effort you didn't give. And eventually, you will suffer the consequences. Guilt, resentment, poor evaluations, and more will, su will surface. More important, you won't feel good about yourself. You won't have given your best. That will take its toll on your self-esteem and, ultimately, your performance. So what's the fix? Read on, brothers and sisters. Larry's short list on how to work. So this is a bullet-pointed list of the lessons you need to take away from this chapter. Stop lying to yourself and everyone else about how hard you work. Work faster, smarter, and harder. Stay busy. Find things to do. Stop periodically during the day and ask yourself, does this matter? Is it contributing to the overall well-being of the company? Am I really getting something done or just killing time? Never tolerate poor performance in yourself or others. Create a clean, organized environment that encourages work. Expect the best from everyone. Teach your employees how to be good workers. Manage priorities, not time. Figure out what absolutely has to get done and then do it first. Never get bogged down with the should get dones or the wouldn't it be nice to get dones or the easy to do's. There is plenty of time to do the right thing. Chapter 1 concludes with a quote from Thomas Edison. Opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. That's a great quote. All right, so that is the preface and chapter one to Larry Winget's It's Called Work for a Reason. Your success is your own damn fault. I hope you understand why I like that guy, why I've bought and read and reread a number of times so many of his books. Like he said in the preface, uh, this is common sense stuff. These are reminders. These are things you know. Uh, even if you don't know them consciously, you know them subconsciously. Every time you slack off at work, you know you're slacking off and you're actually costing the company money rather than generating the company money. You are costing more than you are generating. And that's a recipe for disaster for you and for your employer. So when I 
found Larry Winget. Uh, I was a very young guy. Uh, I'm not sure I'd even achieved my first management job yet. And I read this book. This was the first of his books that I read. And it didn't take long for me to be promoted to my first managerial job. It was not a great managerial job. I remember to this day exactly what my salary was. It was $29,180 per year. There were some benefits too, but that was not a great salary. In any case, I was very, very proud to have achieved that level in such a short time with that employer. And I think partially it was due to the kick in the ass that I got from Larry Winget. Uh, it just takes the right person to come along and say, you know what you're doing isn't right, so do the right thing. And when you do the right thing, you'll be rewarded for it. Do the right thing over and over and over, and you will be successful. So with that, I'm going to finish this bottle of, or sorry, this glass of delicious scotch. This is, again, an Oban 14-year Highland single malt scotch. It's not very late on a Friday night. This is going to put me down in no time. But boy, is it good. So thank you once again. Love it. I'm going to enjoy reading this book.